Hi, my name is Stephanie Joy Phillips. I'm the founder of World Childless Week, and we're here today to talk to Sue Bulmer and listen to her amazing webinar. I'm really interested in this one on the power of creative expression in processing grief. So welcome, Sue. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No, it's really good to have you here. So I'm literally going to disappear from the screen and let you take over and present the webinar for us. Okay, fantastic. So I'll probably just call you back a couple of times throughout um, if I just need some help with um, the comments, but I'll, I'll make a start. So good morning and good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are today. Um, welcome to my webinar about creativity and childlessness and moving forward. So my name is Sue Bulmer and I'm an artist and an art therapist and I'm based in Nottinghamshire in the UK. So firstly, I would like to say a huge thank you to Steph for inviting me to speak to you all today and also for bringing World Childless Week to life. I'm sure you'll agree it's been an amazing week so far, packed full of really good content by some fantastic speakers and that's all down to you, Steph. I'm really honoured to be here sharing this space with you today. It's my first time participating in World Child this week, so I've been sitting on the sidelines for a few years, wondering when I would ever feel brave enough to put my hand up and ask to join in. I can really resonate with what Sarah Roberts and Judy Graham said in the first webinar of this year about how scary it can be to share your own story, um, because it feels like we're putting ourselves in a really vulnerable place. <clears throat> and listening to that webinar really helped me appreciate how important it is to honour our stories and our journeys. And it made me think, from my point of view, why, it, why it's important for me to share my story. So I think part of that reason is to be seen and heard, and I think to get more people talking about these issues of um, childlessness. But also I want to spread the word really about how creative expression can help us come to terms with and accept our childlessness and how it can help us to move forward. Because I've experienced this myself, I want to help other people by giving them the support and the knowledge that I wish I'd had 15 years ago when I was in the thick of all of those big overwhelming feelings of grief. So I'd like to give you an overview of the session so you know what to expect. And that's just, I'm gonna do an introduction, tell you a little bit about me and my journey and how creativity has helped me through the process and helped me to heal. And I'll talk for a while about my arts-based research that I did as part of my master's in art therapy um, course a couple of years ago. And that was um, research into art making um, and exploring the grief and loss associated with infertility. Then we'll go on to have an interactive session where I'll kind of, we can talk a bit about you and about your thoughts about creativity. And we might even bust a few myths in the process. I'll take you through the benefits of creativity for all of us and how we can easily tap into these benefits in our daily lives. The different ways that you can do that, whether that's working on your own, doing something with a friend and a, or a partner or joining a group, or whether you wanted to take a further step to work in therapeutically with an art therapist. So I'll go on to explain what art therapy is, how it works and what you could expect from it, and also how it could help. At this point, I'd just like to do a bit of a self-care um, mention, really. If you find yourself triggered or upset by any of the contents of the webinar, please ensure that you're able to switch off and tend to your own needs, and then come back as soon as you're ready or come back to the recording when you can. So how does that all sound? Hopefully there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end if I don't go on too long. Um, so introductions, I, you might be wondering who I am. You've not seen me before and why I'm here talking to you today. So my name's Sue Bulmer. I'm an artist, I'm a qualified pharmacist and more recently I became an art therapist. So you could say I've got a portfolio career. I'm also childless, not by choice, having gone through many years of trying to conceive. I grew up on a farm in the north of England and I studied pharmacy at Nottingham University. And after that, I spent a few years, up into my 30s really, working in that pharmacy career. I enjoyed art at school, but I didn't really think very much about it. It didn't really have a place in my life during those years. But during my 30s, when the infertility journey began, um, that's kind of when I came back to creativity. We'd had several unsuccessful rounds of treatment and then we made the decision to stop. And that was mainly really to preserve our own sanity and mental health. 
it was a tough decision and it was followed by several really difficult years of trying to come to terms with the unnamed feelings that we now know are grief. And everything that we'd lost, we'd lost hopes, dreams, potential children, we'd lost parenthood, um, and we were trying to work out our purpose in the world now that we weren't going to be parents. So during that time, one of my sisters suggested to me that I re-engage with creativity and I enrolled on a foundation course in art and design and I really enjoyed it. Um, it gave me purpose and it gave me an interest. And I think maybe even back then I was using art as therapy to help me through a difficult time with my struggles. In 2011, I launched my art business and I spent a few years um, after that with my range of original ink illustrations, prints, textiles, cards, um, selling and um, exhibiting my work around the country. I think looking back, it was a really enjoyable time and it was also really healing, um, although I didn't realize it then, but I was enjoying the challenges of living a creative life. It gave me something to get up for in the morning. I got to meet and collaborate with lots of other creative people and um, such as mentors, designers and makers, business coaches and advisors. And lots of opportunities began to came, come my way, which I said yes to. Um, but then eventually, because I was just constantly on the go, I started to feel the signs of burnout several years later. And I pretty much lost my mojo and motivation to create new work. I felt like making art to order just wasn't really very fulfilling. And I spent the next few years dipping in, out, in and out of creativity until one of my business coaches I previously worked with just got in touch um, and said she was um, she was training to be a life coach and she wouldn't wanted to know whether I would be interested in working with her while she did a training. I didn't really think I had anything to lose and I thought that I'd be helping her out so I said yes but really I didn't think that I needed a life coach at, at that time in my life. I was quite happy with how things were thank you very much but uh, how wrong was I? Um, it working with Rebecca, um, it helped me to realize, well, it's helped me to make a real life changing decision. Um, and the whole process, she helped me to examine my passions and interests, what I wanted from life. Um, we looked at skill set, knowledge base, and through the whole process that we went through, I discovered that I could combine my two passions and interests of health and creativity um, in the profession of art therapy. I didn't really know very much about what it was, but it sounded interesting. And they offered the course at Derby University, which is less than an hour from where I live. So I thought about it and thought, well, that seems like quite a good idea. I think I'll do that. Um, and I don't really know what I was thinking at the time, but it seemed like a good idea going back to uni in my mid forties. Um, but at times I did wonder whether it was a bit of a crazy decision. But Rebecca, who was the life coach I worked with, she helped me dismantle all of these self-limiting beliefs and, and blocks that I was putting in my own way. And she helped me to see that it was possible. So off I went with my new pencil case in hand and I was feeling quite scared and vulnerable. I went back to uni age 45. Throughout the master's studies, I was working with bereavement and loss. And I began to look back over previous years and lots of things seemed to fall into place. In one of the many light bulb moments that I had, I realized that I'd been grieving for many years following our failed treatments. And many of the thoughts, feelings and emotions that I'd gone through began to make sense. And I think Jodie talks about this in her Plan B book as well. Um, the art that I'd made during that time had actually helped me start to unconsciously process some of this. And then during the master's studies, I was undergoing personal therapy, which is one of the criteria for being on the course. That also helped me to challenge lots of the beliefs that I subsequently held about myself. And to summarize, that was, I just felt like a bad person for feeling the way that I did. So I used my arts-based research thesis to further explore the grief and loss that I'd experienced. And this whole process was transformational. It was really cathartic and healing, and it helped me to realize the part that my fertility journey had had in leading me to where I was. So I'd like to share a few slides from my research, if I can find them. And slideshow from beginning. There we go, okay. Um, so this, 
image is one of the first ones I've made during my research. Now, I really believe that art is a language that expresses what words cannot. And for me, this, this image helped me to um, express the grief that I was feeling in that repetitive cycle, that it, the way that it can feel when you're in the middle of your grief, when you become stuck, the darkness and the depth and the multiplicity. And it, it reminds me of a vortex, that whirling feeling that you get when you're right in the middle of it all. Image two, this shows the presence of absence, which is a theme that resonated throughout the research period, where there's something missing in your life, but you can't quite put it into words. This image shows the more of the process of what happened after I'd started make, stopped making the two dimensional work and it explores different media that I'd never used before. And the fact that I'd started working in 3D as well, which I've never done before. So there was a lot of trial and error in this part of the research and it brought to mind the failed fertility treatments, the feelings of failure, but also a resilience in the fact that I just kept turning up to try it all again when it went wrong. And it's during this time that the vessel form began to appear. This is a recurring motif that, that crops up time and again when people explore infertility, pregnancy loss and femininity through art. During the next phase of the exploration, I began to explore weaving and that happened quite by chance um, with the piece of the strips of paper that you can see on the top left of the screen. Um, and I started weaving all of these separate pieces of paper together and realized that they actually held themselves together in a cohesive whole. Um, and that made me start to explore weaving using lots of different materials. So it's like I was searching for the material that was just right to express what I wanted. And you can see there that, you know, I used wire, I used um, all sorts of different things, twigs and felted um, twine. And then that culminated in production of, well, of working with felt. Um, now felted vessels are made through a really arduous process of rubbing and then meshing fibers together to make a soft but strong resulting vessel. Um, and that's that was the material that I felt was right for me. I then tried to assimilate my huge pile of vessels that I'd accumulated and try to process and make sense of the work. And I did this through a series of two dimensional um, artworks. And then the final degree show, this is the, the last image, which shows the chronological journey from left to right. And I describe that as a journey from black and white to all the colors. How do I stop sharing? So the themes that arose in my research centered around the ability to remain open and curious, to tolerate sitting with uncertainty and not knowing, and also themes of repetition. I found that my black and white either or thinking was really challenged. Um, this way of thinking can lead us to assume things and that something has to be either one thing or the other. And this in turn shuts down thinking about possibilities and other realities. It helped me to realize that even though I wasn't a mother, I could still be a maternal presence in the therapeutic space. I also became better at tolerating uncertainty and we all like to know, um, we all like to feel certain about things and I was, it took me a lot of practice to be able to sit with uncertainty. At times the whole process felt really uncertain and I didn't feel I knew what I was doing but I learned that if you can start to sit with this and trust the process then things become clearer. The willingness to sit with uncertainty enables the creation of a space where new meanings can be discovered. And I also explored the theme of repetition in terms of strength and resilience. So my research helped me to understand that my childlessness had actually opened up a new space in my life where I could help others. I could use my own maternalness in this space that I'd created um, in my life with a therapeutic capacity to help others. The public exhibition of my work and the fact that my research was published were the next steps in my story and going public and sharing my experience with the world. The research culminated in a, what we call a creative synth 
synthesis of the research methodology I used. And that sort of, um, it's where you bring it all together at the end and you use your intuitive understanding of the research findings to um, synthesize and portray these through a creative medium such as art or poetry. And I did this in the form of a poem, which I named after my research, Metaphorically Maternal. And I'd just like to share that with you now. Unwhole, empty, not mother, other. Failure, longing, loss, lost. Envy, yearning, sadness, anger. Devoid, hollow, absence, present. What is this loss? I have to know. I look inside it, searching for meaning. It is part of me and I am of it. I feel my way through my grief with my eyes closed, memories awakened, fresh and alive in my mind, touched by touch, touched by loss. Circles, vessels, forms emerging. Out of the empty darkness, a whisper of light illuminates. I am more than this. Circles, vessels, forms emerging, informing what is next. Scattering grief, imagining potential space, strength, resilience and growth. I am not one or the other, but countless different things, all the colours, black and white, and many more to be. Okay, having experienced the healing benefits of creativity, I now want to go on to work with others who've gone through such experiences to help them to cope with the traumas of their journey and help them facilitate their own change through creativity. I'm a member of the British Infertility Counselling Association and I've undergone training with them, as well as with the Foundation for Infant Loss. So that's me. I would in for time, that took longer than I thought. Um, so I'd now like to ask Steph to come back, please, if she doesn't mind, and talk a bit about you, not Steph in particular, but all of you. Um, and I'd just like to explore what you think about creativity and how this relates to you. So this section is going to be a little bit more interactive and please feel free to use the chat function um, to contribute if you wish to do so. I'd like to ask you a question. Do you consider yourself to be creative? And do, I, just... do I say what I think? Yeah. Hopefully I was yeah. join in. I've actually got a BA honours in textile design. Ah, right. But what's, so I love creativity. But at the same time, I can't draw. I'm bloody useless at drawing. Right, okay. Do you know what I mean? So I think everybody finds their own form of creativity because I remember being at college and whatever we were supposed to be doing that day fell apart. So they stuck us in the room with a load of fruit and teapots and things like that in the middle of the room and said, here you go, draw that. And everybody was like, oh, seriously, still life. Mm -hmm. That's so boring. Yeah, it's boring. It's boring. It's nothing exciting. And they said, oh, we've just managed to get a model in next door so you can do some life drawing if you want. Everybody went, yay, and ran out of the room. And I just went, I'm worse at that than still life. And I stayed with the bananas. Do you know what I mean? Because we all find what we can do in different ways. And that's why I really, Absolutely. you know, you've got to find that's your why, Yeah, That's why a lot of people think they're not creative because they can't draw. Yeah. Um, and usually I don't know whether anybody's put anything in the chat about whether they would consider themselves creative or not but usually when I ask this question oh somebody's just put I do know people are yeah oh that's great fantastic well maybe I might I'll not have as many myths to bust then um <laughs> usually when I ask this question people say no I'm not creative um and I just try to find out from them where these beliefs come from because they can be instilled with us from a very young age um from parents, teachers, friends. But one of the definitions of creativity is the use of imagination or original ideas to create something. Um, and it's also defined as the tendency to generate or recognize ideas, alternatives or possibilities that might be useful in, in solving problems, communicating with others or entertaining ourselves. So maybe I'd just like to challenge for people who think they're not creative. Do you solve problems? Do you have ideas? Do you have an imagination? If the answer is yes, maybe I'd just like to think, well, do you still not think you're creative? Is anyone changing their mind? Because I believe we're all creative and creativity comes in many forms. It's not just about being able to paint or a beautiful still life or write a novel or compose a symphony. It could be how we dress in the morning. It could be how we cook our food and set the table. It could be how we plant our garden decorate our home or workspace, how we arrange a bouquet of flowers in a vase, how we think, how we solve our problems, how we come up with new ideas. 
if we have an imagination, we are creative. So I think we're all creative. So now I would just like to um, share my screen again and talk about how good it is for us to create. Actually, no, I'm going to share my screen for the next one. So I'll just talk through how creativity can benefit us. It can lift our mood. It can make us feel good about ourselves. If you think about a time when you completed a creative pursuit, such as knitting a scarf or making a meal, be friends and family, decorating a room, it can give us a feeling of, an of enhanced well-being. It raises our self-esteem and we feel like, oh, look what, look what I've just done. Um, so we feel good because we've achieved something. We've made something where there was previously nothing. It can improve cognitive function. So it gets your right and left brain um, talking to each other and it improves connections in the brain. And it also helps us to process what's going on and to make meaning of our experiences. Because since the beginning of time, making meaning through creativity is the way that humans, creativity is the way that humans have been able to make sense of their place in the world and make meaning. It can also help reduce feelings of isolation when we participate in a creative group activity. So it can help improve social lives and it can help us to feel connected to others but also to ourselves, it can alleviate stress and anxiety. And studies have been carried out that show a decrease in levels of our stress hormone levels, cortisol, after a short time of making art, and also how it can lower heart rate and blood pressure. It can help improve physical as well as mental well-being, helping people recover from illnesses such as stroke or psychosis. It can help improve our immune system and it can help relieve pain in some studies. It can also help us to solve problems by thinking in new ways, considering things from different perspectives and looking differently. It allows us to express ourselves. I see art as a bridge between the internal and external world and through moving things from internal to external, such as feelings, thoughts and emotions, getting them from the inside to the outside in the form of a tangible, um, object it can be extremely cathartic and therapeutic it can also bring a sense of joy and well-being and creativity is available to us all so if it's this good why aren't we doing it more maybe we feel that life's too busy um maybe we think it's really frivolous to spend our time being creative or we might feel we don't have the time the space the energy or the money we might not think we'll be good at it so we might think we'll fail and we don't want to fail we might feel that creativity is for children. Who knows? But I do know that having more creativity in your life can bring so many benefits. And when you look at some of the possible implications of being childless, not by choice and the journey to get there, you can begin to see how living a more creative life could help us to move forward from our past experience and live a more full and expressive life. So I just want to share with you a few of the feelings and thoughts that went through my mind during and after my journey and some of these might resonate with you and feel free to add more in the chat if you'd like to. Feelings of failure and inadequacy, loss of control of life, feeling helpless and that my happiness was in someone else's hands, experiencing really low self-esteem, experiencing problems in relationships, and this could be with partner, family or friends. For me, at one point, all of my best friends were pregnant at the same time and I was the only one who wasn't. I didn't want to spend time with any of them because it made me feel rubbish. I didn't feel like I fitted in anymore and it was just too painful. I was meant to be feeling happy for them, but which I was, but I also felt unhappy for us and this far outweighed the happy. I think it was Tessa Broad who mentioned on Monday that there's not actually a word for being happy and sad at the same time. There's no word in our language. I felt really that nobody understood and some of my close friends gave me a really hard time for not going to see them with their new babies, um, which added to the shame that I felt and the separateness and isolation. Being childless not by choice can leave us facing identity issues. You could think if I'm a childless person, then who am I? What is my worth and what use am I to anyone? And there are a lot more as well. Depression, grief, envy, isolation, disconnection, shame, which then compounds the isolation and disconnection. 
But using creativity during my research and my personal therapy helped me explore many of these issues from writing in my angry journal to making art about vessels and containers. I was unknowingly starting to process and tell my story through creativity. So if that sounds interesting, you might be thinking, well, what can I do? Well, the good news is you don't have to wait. You can start right now. You can pick up a pen and start writing or buy some pencils, pens or paints and draw out your feelings. I think you've just got to think. Yeah, you've just got to think about what feels right for you. What are your interests? What are your passions? What have you always thought? Oh, I wouldn't mind giving that a try. Um, is there someone in your life that you share an interest with and that you, could you do something together? What's on in your local area? So joining a club or a class could be some people's idea of fun, sharing experiences with others. But I do appreciate that if you're more introverted, you might find this idea horrendous. So maybe you could explore what's available online or you could do something by yourself. All I would say is switch off your inner critic, keep an open mind. And if you're trying something new, just be prepared to have a laugh and be prepared to fail and just have some fun. So if you're working alone or with a friend or with a group, doesn't sound quite right for you. You might even want to take the step to working with someone therapeutically, in which case you could work with a, an art therapist if you wanted to explore this issue creatively. I think the important thing is just to make a start. The next slide just gives some simple ideas. So I'm just trying to share my screen again. This gives some simple ideas about ways that you can boost creativity in your life, but there are many more that you can add. Okay, hopefully you can see that screen. So I'm not gonna read through them, but if you just have a look through them yourself, there are many different things that you might not have considered as creative that will help boost creativity in your life. Looking at hobbies, meditation, setting yourself a challenge, being outside more, taking photographs, listening to music or poetry, um, making different kinds of art, visiting exhibitions, um, writing down your dreams, making a mood board, mandalas, collages, cookery, dance and movement, drama, singing, you know, the possibilities really are endless. You start gardening. Um, yes, so that just gives an idea of different ways that you could be more creative. So if you decide that you wanted to take a more therapeutic approach, you could explore working with an art therapist, a creative arts therapist, of which there are many different kinds. So we are healthcare professionals who use creative and expressive arts-based processes in a safe, non-judgmental therapeutic envi environment to help people improve their well-being. There are art, drama and music therapists and we're regulated professions. We're all members of the Health and Care Professions Council, the HCPC in the UK. And we have protected titles which can't be used by other professions. But there are also dance and movement therapists and therapists who use creative writing and poetry in their work. But art therapy is my speciality and it's a form of psychotherapy that uses art media as its primary method of communication. And it helps people explore and express emotional issues that they might be finding confusing or distressing. It can be delivered to individuals, couples, families or groups, and there are many different therapeutic approaches. And we can work in a directive or a non-directive way with our clients. So if you're wondering how this could help you, this next slide just kind of summarises the different ways that art therapy can help people. It can help focus on and externally express yourself um, and help you find ways to cope with complicated feelings and emotions. We can also explore different parts of the self, what we like and dislike about ourselves and explore self-acceptance. It can help us to make sense of our feelings and increase our self-understanding. The act of creating a physical object, which can then be reflected on with the therapist can be really beneficial because it can help you look and think differently. As many of us, 
may not have had the chance of a normal grieving ritual that comes with the loss, a loss such as a death or a bereavement. Working with ritual in art therapy um, to explore our disenfranchised disenfranchised grief can be a really healing part of our journey. This was one of the parts of my personal therapy, which I'll never forget. And I think it will stay with me as long as I live. And I truly believe this helped me to process and move forward. Making art can increase our self-esteem, as I've said earlier, by working on and promoting strengths and resilience. You can, in art therapy, you can also focus on the body and what the body needs. And you can incorporate mindfulness and movement or you can explore different techniques that help you feel grounded. We could work with life stories, past and future, through vision boards or just general art materials. And this might help us to reevaluate life and our own priorities and also to rewrite our stories and imagined futures. We can focus on acknowledging the loss and the grief and the impact that it's had on our lives. For me, being able to name the feelings as grief was such an important step in my journey naming the unknown. No one had ever told me that I would go through grief. So the realization when this hit was huge. We can work with metaphor and that can help us to explore our losses and make meaning from that. We can focus on something called psychoeducation, which um, is kind of sharing knowledge about why our body works the way it does. We can examine the stress response and how we react to triggering situations. And that can help us to normalize how we're feeling as well. Um, we can look at avoidance tactics and reactions and it can help us to build new coping strategies. Or we can work through and explore the different models of grief. And this just helps people to understand and normalize how they're feeling. If you're somebody who's motivated by goals and aims, we can work with those in art therapy and that can foster a sense of achievement and progress. It can, art therapy can simply give you a safe space away from daily life in which to make art next to someone else and think creatively about life's challenges or just to simply sit with the sadness and acknowledge that's how it is today. Group work can facilitate belonging, community and mutual understanding and it can decrease feelings of isolation. Art therapy can help change your perspective by exploring and gently challenging entrenched thoughts and beliefs. And for me, I think personal therapy helped me to start liking myself again after years of feeling like I was a bad person. So it helps us to channel, uh, challenge our inner critic. And it can help instill hope as well by looking to the future, thinking of endings and beginnings. There's a great quote, which I found myself going back to during my training time and again by T.S. Eliot about endings and beginnings. And it, it goes like this. What we call the beginning is often the end. To make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. And I think this is so true in life's journeys. I feel this gives hope for what is to come. So you might be wondering what you could expect if you did want to pursue working therapeutically with an art therapist, what would we actually do? Well, I can only talk about what my approach would be. Other art, art therapists might work in a slightly different way. But the one thing that I need to emphasize is that you don't need to be good at art in order to have art therapy. You just need to maintain an open mind, be curious and trust the process. We would usually have an initial conversation to try and ascertain whether art therapy is right for you. And there might be reasons that it wouldn't be, such as if you were working with a therapist for another reason, we would probably wait until that had finished until we started working together. We could also explore your experiences of previous therapy to see whether there might be any reasons that you've got any strong negative feelings or blocks towards working therapeutically. I would provide an information leaflet about my service and also provide time to ask questions. Starting something new like art therapy can be really scary and I can definitely vouch for that. So you may be feeling nervous and unsure of what to expect. I would explain safeguarding and confidentiality processes which are there to keep clients safe. And the times when I would need to break confidentiality such as if there was abuse or crimes occurring or somebody was in danger. And also clinical supervision. 
which that's a regulatory requirement for everyone in our profession and it ensures safe practice and that's also bound by confidentiality. We would decide to start or not and we would set a date and a time for our sessions, usually weekly at the same time, but other options could be explored. We used to just work face to face, but since COVID, there's been a huge increase in online working. And also that kind of helps us to get around geographical um, limits that we've got of working with people. During the first session, there'd usually be an assessment and that would include lots of questions so I could find out more about you. This would include a safety and risk assessment. And so we might explore things like emergency contacts or if there's somebody that you could call after the session if you became distressed. If you felt it would be useful, we might formulate some aims or goals for therapy or areas that you feel would be useful for you to work on. This isn't always the case, but it might work for you. I'm also happy to work with the here and now and just work with whatever my clients bring each week. We could start and work on a short or a long term basis, and that would be completely decided by the therapist and the client. I usually work in a non-directive way, which means that I don't come with a, a barrage of exercises and tasks for my clients to complete. But sometimes people find that they don't know where to start, so I might explore and maybe lead people if they're finding it really difficult to start just by exploring something that's an issue for them today and see if they want to explore it in an image. But I do find the most impactful work is done when the work is purely led by the client and what they bring. So art therapy is not for everyone, but it's a fantastic alternative to verbal counselling for clients who find that they simply aren't the words to express their experience. Now, I would like to share my screen again because it's just a short video that I'd like to share that really sums up without words, really, how art therapy can work. Can we be able to hear this?
Oh, I really love that video. Um, it just sums it up how art therapy can kind of give you the tools to deal with your stuff. Um, and don't get me wrong, there are times, even for me, with the journey that I've come through where that rucksack does get heavy or a few things might drop out of it. Um, but I've got the rucksack now so I can carry things a little bit more easily. Um, that's it really. Um, I would just say if you did want to explore working with an art therapist, just Google art therapists in my area, wherever you are. Um, each country's art therapy professional body will hold a list of qualified art therapists as well. So that could be somewhere else that you could look. Um, if you wanted to speak to me, I'm sure Steph would be able to share my details. Um, I'm on social media on Trent Valley Art Therapy, but also my infertility work account is Metaphorically Maternal, which I named after my research. To end with, I'd just like to leave you with a few quotes from a couple of references that I've drawn from to that inform my practice. And for me, they demonstrate the power of art and creativity to help us process complex issues such as grief and how it can help us to heal. So I'll share my screen one more time. And there we go. Sean McNiff from Art Heals. Art Heals by accepting the pain and doing something with it. It adapts every conceivable problem and lends transformative, insightful and experience heightening powers to people in need. Many of us explore the healing power of art on our own, while others do it with the guidance and in the safety of therapeutic relationships. If we can liberate the creative process in our lives, it will always find the way to whatever needs attention and transformation. Art heals by transforming isolation and connection and connecting us to others, to places and to ourselves in life affirming ways. Art healing is for everyone. And then Laura Seftel in a really fantastic book that I've got here called Grief Unseen. Um, she believes that developing personal forms of expression such as journal writing, art making and creating rituals can be profoundly helpful during times of distress. No background in the arts is needed in order to engage in the creative process. So anyone can do it. And that's the end of my webinar. Um, I'd just like to thank you all for listening and for having me today. Steph, I hope that was okay. It was good. Thank you, Sue. And I think like the real thing to get across is you do not have to be what somebody calls an artist. You don't. It literally can be some crayons you've had for 20 years since school sitting in a drawer going dusty or picking up a borrow and a scrap piece of paper and doodling while you're watching TV. Yeah. Yeah, and it's art, it's creation. And like you say, you mentioned gardening. Somebody in the chat mentioned gardening. It's not even about paint or pencils. It's art. about cooking, like you say. It's all different forms of expressing yourself. Yeah, that's exactly it. And it's creating something, especially for pe people like us who have been able, unable to create the thing that we really want to create which is a child, to be able to go on and create something else is such a powerful process. Mm. Whatever that thing is, it's yeah. creating something from nothing. It's finding out what you're drawn to, whether it is paint, pens, scrapbooking, some people like to do journaling, people like to do, the, we go back to the gardening again, and the cooking, and it could be icing cakes, it could be any form of expression that just takes you out of yourself sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there are there are lots of different books available about creative journaling um, and the, the different things that you can work through. There are books actually that have been published by people who have published their journal. That's that's one of them. It's called Spilling Open. And it just shows the different ways that sort of she's used her creative journal to just get all of the stuff out in images, writing. Um, and I, I kept a journal through my infertility years and I went back to read through it when I was doing my research and I, it was a tough read but it, it made me realise how angry I'd been very yeah. very angry and that I didn't realise at the time and I think going back like um to look revisit as well can be a really powerful way of just gaining perspective and appreciating how far you've come yeah because we don't always say to people you don't always see how far you've gone forward until you look backwards 
yeah and another point I want to say as well is don't be afraid of producing ugly art embrace the ugly art because it's still expressing some form of emotion yeah I am um, I say that to a lot of my art therapy clients you know art therapy is not necessarily about producing a pretty picture you might want to put on your wall it could just be about getting all of that rubbish and the ter horrible feelings and not rubbish but the, the horrible feelings and negativity sometimes out there and making something really ugly because that might just be how we're feeling today yeah, because I went on a cosmic um, smash booking course a while ago. Ah, yes. And the one thing that was freaking me out was the fact, like, if I say I've got a degree in textile design, how can I share what I've got? If what I look at, what other people produce and think, oh, that's beautiful, mine's ugly. And I hadn't done art for about 20 years and it was, I felt rusty, but it was so nice and refreshing to do it again. And I'll show you, because these are two things that I produced at the time. Ah, I yes. thought, ugly art. But again, it was like you, it was just getting the anger out and the bitterness and, yeah. you know. And you can see that in the yeah. movement of the, the pen. The aggression of the, the actual marks as well. And it just, it doesn't matter. And I think that's what we need to express, but it really doesn't matter what you produce. No. You don't have to show anybody. It can be just for you. You don't. I think there's so much pressure nowadays, isn't there, to share everything on social media, but there's no, you know, people who keep creative journals or just want to make art for themselves you know a big black scribble because I'm feeling horrible today can really you know it's about the process as well of making not necessarily about the product mm. it could be writing a swear word really yeah. hard on a piece of paper but then coloring it in with your favorite colors because you've yeah. changed from the anger to the yeah and some of my um, ex colleagues yeah. got me um, a swear coloring book and actually yeah. I find myself going back to that some days and just thinking yeah, that's the word for today. And I'm going to colour that in. <laughs> it's really helpful. Yeah, no, and I've, I've got one of the story I suddenly thought of as well was um, when I was at art college and somebody came in and was talking about art therapy and saying that you never stop learning as the therapist because somebody bought in a piece of paper and half it was this bright, vibrant, gorgeous red and the other half was black. And I thought, oh, and they said, well, you know, trying to get the person to talk about it. So they said, well, the red's last week and the black's this week. And it was like, so what were your emotions then? Was there, a pro you know, was that you were happier last week and this week something's happened? And he went, no, 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 no. He says, last week I was in the red in my bank account and this week I'm in the black, so I'm really happy. So it's not even how you understand. And it, it, it does, that, that shows how personal it is, yeah. the patient is to yourself. And also as well, it um, it shows that we all have a different response when we see a piece of art. So art therapy is not at all about the art therapist um, interpreting the art that that client has made. It's about working with them to try and help them to, to bring, take their meaning from it. Um, and, and that meaning can change as well. So maybe one day it might be, oh, well, that day I was in the red and then I was in the black. But another time he looks at it, he might just think, well, yeah, it might mean something totally different. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of it. Like you say, we all appreciate different art forms. Yeah. And it's time we start to appreciate what we can create as well. Yeah. And those benefits as well, you know, they're so far reaching. It's like people who say that they've started to meditate and they've noticed all of these positive changes in life. I think if you start to practice creativity on a regular basis, whatever that is, you know, it could just be writing a gratitude, three lines in a gratitude journal every night. But I think those small things practiced regularly can have such a huge effect, yeah. a huge benefit. Definitely. Just do whatever you feel comfortable with. Mm. Accept that, embrace it, and just move on. Yeah. 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 If you don't like it that day, chuck it in the bin. Yeah. Rip it in half if you like some of the colours and see if when you yeah. rip it in half, and rip it in half, and again, there's a little bit in there you actually love. Absolutely. And use that as a focal point for a, a collage the next day or something. Yeah. 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 I noticed we've got, oh, a couple of questions. Oh, yes. I meant to say there were some questions. Getting chatting away. So the first one was, uh, thank you so much for all of the ideas and for your story. I suffer from depression, anxiety, as well as chronic pain. And I find that I hide in my phone, watching things and listening to programmes. How do I get brave enough to be in the world enough to get creative? A huge question I know any ideas would help well I would maybe um consider what you like and and also 
just start doing it with just yourself. You know, you don't have to just put your phone down and pick up a piece of paper and a pen and, you know, or some pencils or some crayons even and just make a start. Or if that sounds too scary, you know, go back to the presentation and think about are, are any of those things, do any of those things sound manageable for me? Could You could just start with something as simple as... Um, how about a piece of paper beside line. the phone? I was thinking, I was thinking a piece of paper beside the phone. So if they read something annoys me, they okay, okay, ignore that two minutes, 20 seconds of doing something on the paper. Yeah. Even and maybe building up the time on the paper and yeah. Breaking the connection to the phone, perhaps. Even. Yeah, yeah. And just just start, I'd say, and just don't have try not to have any expectations of what you think it should be. You know, don't think that, uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to start and be creative tomorrow and I'm going to spend, you know, half a day doing some creative pursuit. Just make it really small, bite size, baby steps, something manageable and something that's achievable yeah. and realistic. Yeah. Don't go out and spend a fortune on art stuff and then look at it and go, oh, I've spent money. I need to create something beautiful with it now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you for that. And we've got a second question, which is, in your art therapy work, do you find that some media are more conducive than others to express one's feelings and emotions? Yes, <laughs> I do. So we try to, oh, there are, there are loads of articles that have been written on this and I'm trying to think of, of them, but there, there are so many different materials that we can use and I, some people don't like to use messy materials that are difficult to control yeah. because they like to ma maintain a degree of control in the session. So they might choose something like a felt tip, which makes a mark that doesn't bleed. There's no water involved in it and it's very easy to contain. Whereas others might go straight for the watercolours or start pouring paint and mixing things. And some people like to make slime. Some people like to make collage. I think it's just what's right for that person on that day yeah because I like deco patch I like the mess I like the organization of the colors but I don't mind if I get covered in covered in glue I suppose the creation with that would be similar in a way to somebody who cooks mm. and gets their hands in with the dough or the cake mixture or in the garden in the earth again you know lots of articles written about uh, at touch and therapy and the benefits that working with messy materials or with clay can have for us yeah it's it's a huge thing yeah. somebody's read said there's a great book called your inner critic it's a big jerk that gives some great ideas for beginner art and how to manage your inner critic well that sounds ideal that yeah. sounds good really yeah. good so oh is there any more questions at the two we just had i think that's two we had yeah just brilliant so thank you so much, Sue. I think everyone's got a lot of this. I have. I've really enjoyed hearing your oh perspective God, and research. Yeah, it, I think it's inspired people. And like you say, the biggest thing to take away is you don't need to be that much good at being an artist. You don't have to be an artist. You don't have to be a creator. You can just do what you want. Yeah. Find, like you say, the meditative power of doing what you're doing. And you suddenly realise that for five minutes or an hour, you didn't think about what was actually mm -hmm. causing you grief. Yeah. yeah fantastic so yes i guess i better end this rather than just talk to you all afternoon about it um thinking about it though for people who are here and want to explore their art and the creation more or try it for the first time the next webinar with um anastasia mcdonald is actually called art as soul work workshop she's doing a little meditation and then there's time behind that to actually do some creation so again with your bar your piece of paper your paint whatever it is you've got bring it along, I'll be there, I'll be creating some ugly art or some beautiful art or whatever else it is in the middle, um, we can create together. And I think that leads us perfectly from this webinar because we're sort of mm. saying, do it, go out there, yeah. do it. Yeah, just go do, out it. There, do it. Be brave. I dare you. Yeah. <laughs> right, there you go, especially from Sue, not me. You've been dared to attend the next <laughs> so thank you again Sue it has been wonderful yeah you're and welcome. hopefully we'll connect again and do something further going forward yeah that would be amazing thanks Brilliant. so much thank you bye bye